Welcome to Down to Earth That Heavenly Minded Podcast. Hosted by Irving Rich. Light from the Land of the Sphinx. Chapter 34, The High Priest and the Priests of Jehovah. Mosaic law made a sharp distinction between the priesthood and the people. Jehovah would have regarded all Israel upon their redemption from Egypt as a kingdom of priests, but the nation proved itself incapable of bearing the honor, and thus the divine purpose became narrowed. One tribe out of Israel was selected for the ministry, one family of that tribe for the priesthood, and one person of that family for the high priesthood. The election of Aaron for the honor of the high priesthood was a matter of divine choice, Hebrews chapter 5 verse 4, and the honor descended from father to son. But so emphatic is the necessity for a high priest to be called of God, that even Christ glorified not himself to be high priest, but God appointed him to the service. Verse 5, the importance of the high priesthood is incalculable, whether to Israel or to the church, and in Aaron, called of God on Horeb to the high priesthood. There shines forth a remarkable type of the Son of God greeted high priest in heaven by Jehovah. Having consecrated his dwelling to himself in Israel's midst, Jehovah set apart his priests to serve him in that dwelling. Their service, speaking broadly, was composed of three parts, attendance upon the brazen altar, the holy, and the holiest. The first was the service of the priests generally, though on certain occasions the high priest alone could fulfill its ministry, the second was the service of the priests and the high priest. The third was the service of the high priest alone. The contrast between the priesthood in Egypt and that in Israel is very marked. In Egypt, the members of one and the same family also often served different gods, showing that the priesthood was regarded as any other profession, in which it was of the first importance to gain a good livelihood irrespective of any particular temple. The importance of remembering the order of God, first, the dwelling, next, its servants, is very great. The glory of Jehovah entered the dwelling before the consecration of the priests, and the accompanying anointing of the tabernacle and its vessels. This principle is in direct contrast with that which prevailed in Egypt, where the first duty of the high priest who lived under these great royal builders was to direct the buildings for the enlargement of the temple. He had to do splendidly in his temple as great superintendent of the works, even if he delegated the direction of the building itself to other special officials. In addition he was general of the troops of the god, and governed his house of silver. To render the priests fit for their ministry, purification, adorning, and anointing were necessary. The adorning, being instituted prior to the other necessities, must be first considered. The ordinary garments worn by the people were so entirely different from those to which we are accustomed that we introduce drawings of the blue tasseled or fringed robe spoken of in the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 15 verses 38 to 41. No manner of service within the sanctuary and its court was lawful apart from the robes of service, see Exodus chapter 39 verse 1, the garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. The number of these robes was four for the priests, eight for the high priest. The garments of the priests resembled those of the high priest, which were not golden, as will be presently detailed. Save when engaged in their ministry the priests of Jehovah dressed as did the people. To sanctify him, Aaron and his sons, that he might be a priest to Jehovah. Sanctification not merely in the removal of uncleanness, but in its transferring character to divine glory. See, Biblical Commentary on the Old Testament, Exodus, Kyle and Delich, page 193. Exodus chapter 28 verses 3 to 4. The number of blessedness. The number associated in the Christian mind with resurrection. The breadth of the difference between Jehovah's priests and those of Egypt, when robed, was very great. The Egyptian priests had to be robed differently upon the occurrence of the different duties of their service. The most important exactions required by the gods were the mode of stating the formulas accompanying the act of sacrifice. These were always recited with the same rhythm. According to a system of melody in which every tone had its virtue, combined with movements which confirmed the sense, and worked with irresistible effect. One false note, a single discord between the succession of gestures and the utterance of the sacramental words, any hesitation, any awkwardness in the accomplishment of a rite, and the sacrifice was vain. In contrast with this divine regulation, the custom which had grown up in Egypt may be pointed out. The priests of the new empire showed that they were the disciples of past pious ages by the dress, which they wore in private life, even at feasts. The high priests alone may have been allowed to wear ordinary dress. Whilst the dress of the priests varied in so many particulars, the custom of shaving the head seems to have been common amongst all the ecclesiastics of the new empire. They shaved, doubtless, from reasons of cleanliness, as Herodotus clearly states. Men of other professions, cut their hair very short, and wore artificial coiffures. 
the priests, on the other hand, did not, even when out of doors, protect their bare heads from the heat of the sun, at feasts also they wore no wigs, though they anointed the skin of their heads with oil. Like the other guests who wore hair. This was the custom in later times, but under the old empire, even in the manner of dressing the hair, there existed no difference between the clergy and the laity, they all wore the same style of coiffure. Aaron's garments were assumed in the following order, the linen coverings, the linen coat, the robe of the ephod, the ephod, the breastplate, the girdle of the ephod, the mitre, the crown. Exodus chapter 29 verses 5 to 6. The linen coverings, or concealers, literally, were of a negative character, their purpose was to hide man. Exodus chapter 28 verse 42. The rest of the robes were to adorn, verse 40, the man who was the type of Christ. The coat or vest was patterned linen, indeed, all the garments worn next to the person were of shining linen, and, save the coverings, which were of plain linen. Holiness or purity in its resplendence was written upon each of them. In typical holiness Jehovah's priests ministered before him. The significance of white linen was familiar to the ancients. The Egyptian priests wore cotton garments at times, but none but linen rolls were used when within the temples. The Egyptians wear a linen tunic fringed about the legs, and over this they have a white woolen garment thrown on afterward. Nothing of woolen, however, is taken to their temples. The robe of the ephod was composed of one piece of woven work, its many threads brought into unity were an emblem of oneness, as was Christ's robe, for which the soldiers cast lots. John chapter 19 verses 23 to 24. It was all of blue, it proclaimed the heavenly character of the wearer. The opening in it for the head was bound round with a strong binding, after the style of a coat of mail. The reason given being, that it be not rent. Thus was figured in it a strength which should be proof against use. As it were the whole of an on Exodus chapter 28 verse 32. The original word is Egyptian, though its root appears to be Semitic. Corslets of linen such as appear to be here referred to, were well known amongst the Egyptians. The unity in itself of the robe, its heavenly color, its coat of mail-like strength, afford three beautiful symbols of the service of our great high priest in heaven. This robe, which was without sleeves, was worn over the snow-white coat, and the arms of the garment shone against it like the white clouds of heaven upon the deep blue sky. Its skirts reached towards the feet, which were bare, for the ground within the sanctuary walls was holy. The hem of the skirt was ornamented with golden bells and forms of pomegranates. The pomegranates were composed of the blue, the purple, and the scarlet of the sanctuary. The pomegranate flower is bell-shaped, and of a golden crimson hue, its fruit is full of seeds, and is an emblem of exceeding productiveness. The bell and the fruit alternated. A golden bell and a pomegranate, a golden bell and a pomegranate, Exodus chapter 28 verse 34, was the divine order. First, melodious sound, next, fruitfulness. The sound of the steps of the high priest was ever to be heard as he approached Jehovah. The music of the robe, the bells being golden, imply a sound which is divinely glorious, announced his way, and his steps were full of fruit to man and trod. The word of God, which voices the priesthood of our Lord, is rich with divine melody. The steps of Israel's high priest in the sanctuary, were foretellings of our high priest's footsteps in heaven itself. Indeed, the sound of the bells has echoed around this earth ever since our great high priest entered heaven for us, for when he ascended up on high, he, the mighty victor over sin and death, led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. The accumulating voices of the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers he has given to the church, are the echo of the sound of the bells. And all the fruit borne up to heaven from this earth is as seed of the pomegranates upon the skirts of the robe of the ephod. The ephod was of all other garments particularly splendid. It was made of linen into which were wrought the sanctuary colors and threads of gold. Thus the very splendor of the dwelling place of God was the adornment of his high priest. The robe of the ephod, the shoulder pieces of the ephod, the breastplate, not loosed from the ephod, Exodus chapter 39 verses 22, 18, 21, and 8, and formed, like the work of the ephod, all indicate the importance of this vestment. It was composed of two sections, which were held together by the shoulder pieces, and, the curious girdle of the ephod. The ephod was, the shoulder dress, the sign of the burden of the office asterisk of the wearer. Upon the shoulder pieces of the robe precious stones, engraven with the names of Israel's sons, were set. Six names rested on either shoulder, and did so, according to, the, birth, of those represented, Exodus chapter 28 verse 10, and, the two stones upon the shoulders of the ephod, were, stones of memorial unto the children of Israel. And Aaron bore, the names before Jehovah upon his two shoulders as a memorial. Verses 11, and 12. The whole burden, the prosperity, and the future glory of Israel rested upon the strength of the high priest, who appeared in Jehovah's presence for them.
the graven jewels were kept in their places by strands of intertwined gold wire, wreathen chains of gold. The many strands combined in one, offer a symbol of the many varieties of divinely expressed glory, which unite in one chain of unbroken strength, sustaining the purpose of God. Upon a rock sculpture of a king conqueror, inscribed across the breast from shoulder to shoulder this legend runs, with my own shoulders, I conquered this land. See Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6. Where one shoulder is used as the figure of strength for government, and Luke chapter 15 verse 5, where two shoulders signify the strength of the shepherd in home bearing the sheep. This robe was worn when inquiry was made of God on behalf of the people, and it was so bound together upon the person of Israel's high priest by shoulder pieces and breastplate that, speaking figuratively, it was held in its place by remembrance of them and bearing of their burden. It was indeed the robe of office, but the office was such that he who bore it needed acquaintance with, and power in service for, those whom he served mediatorially. And in Christ, our high priest in heaven, who serves for his people in the presence of his God, there is ever the gracious remembrance of them individually, and the bearing of their burden. Every true priest on earth partakes in some measure at least of these essentials in his intercessionary service. The office cannot be divorced from the moral qualities of the office bearer, he is invested with these holy qualities, as the priests of old were with their holy garments, otherwise he cannot minister for men before God. Even as they could not minister for Israel apart from their holy garments. The breastplate was attached by the golden chains to the shoulder pieces. Upon it were twelve precious stones engraven with the names of the sons of Israel, whose judgment Aaron bore upon his heart. Connected with it were the Urim and the Thummim, borne by the high priest, but what these were none can tell, they are lost. Neither can the designations of the precious stones be given, as the meaning of the original words is unknown. The order in which the names of the tribes of Israel were inscribed upon the breastplate is also unknown, but for a divine reason. We are not to suppose that any one of the redeemed takes the precedence of another upon the high priest's breast, for all are loved perfectly. The oldest may, indeed, come first upon his shoulders, for the longest liver is upheld the longest upon this earth by our high priest, but his love knows no priority of favor. Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end, John chapter 13 verse 1, or perfectly. Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually, Exodus chapter 28 verse 30. That is the judicial sentence by which everyone is either justified or condemned. In prophetic vision, as in actual oriental life, the sentence of justification was often expressed by the nature of the robe worn. It seems to be sufficiently obvious that the breastplate of righteousness or judgment, resplendent with the precious stones, on which were engraved the names of the twelve tribes, was intended to express by symbols the acceptance of Israel grounded upon the sacrificial functions of the high priest. Smith's Dictionary of the Bible, Art. High Priest. The symbol of the two shoulders of the high priest bearing up the weight of Israel's burden before Jehovah is answered in the New Testament by such words as these. He is able to succor, he is able to save. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 18, and Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25. And the great words, for us, we have such an high priest, such an high priest became us. In the presence of God for us, Hebrews chapter 8 verse 1, Hebrews chapter 7 verse 26, and Hebrews chapter 9 verse 24, guarantee to the whole of the church all the favors expressed by all Israel's names upon shoulders and breastplate. By Aaron's shoulders, not by Israel's strength, by Aaron's breastplate, not by Israel's constancy, did the people appear before Jehovah, and by Christ's strength, and by Christ's love, are we maintained in the presence of our God. The girdle, the sixth of the garments, was splendid, like the ephod. It was worn across the breast, see Revelation chapter 1 verse 13, and around the loins. It was so bound about the wearer that a fod, shoulder pieces, and breastplate could not be dissociated. An investiture of personal glory is here portrayed. He whom Israel's high priest prefigured, the wearer of the girdle, in the day appointed, and in his own person, will establish on the earth the honors which are his, symbolized by the sanctuary colors he will. By virtue of his suffering unto death, reign over the earth, and in him all shall recognize the Lord from heaven, perfect in holiness, and divine. The shape of this garment cannot be defined. But typical holiness covered the head of the high priest before God and before man. The cap worn by the high priest after the failure of the line of kings developed into a semblance of royalty, which was not its first intention. Josephus doubtless gives a true account of the high priest's turban as worn in his day. It may be fairly conjectured that the crown, i.e., a triple crown of gold, was appended when the Asmoneans united the temporal monarchy with the priesthood, and that this was continued, though in a modified shape. After the sovereignty was taken from them. Smith's Dictionary of the Bible, Art, High Priest. 
the holy crown, the small band of gold worn above the cap and over the forehead, was the eighth of the garments of glory and beauty. It was assumed last, and, indeed, the crown is ever placed last upon the wearer's head. All other robes lead up to the crown. The high priest's crown was notable for its simplicity, it was a narrow band of gold, and its ornament was neither jewels nor feathers, but a few plain words. Holiness to Jehovah, whether he appeared before the people as Jehovah's representative, or whether he appeared before Jehovah as representing Israel, there ever shone forth over his brow an ornament and glory more precious than jewels, or earth's costliest gifts. Words of God. Yet why should the high priest wear a crown? No high priest in Israel was king. We have already called attention to the fact that the priest king was present in Jehovah's mind before he separated the priest and the king in their order in Israel. The priest king is of the order of Melchizedek, and the glory of the coming priest king, and his chief honor in his kingdom on earth, and the beauty of his crown shall be, holiness to Jehovah. Priest kings of the heathen ruled the world when Aaron was robed in the wilderness, and entered upon the service of Jehovah. They had their crowns, their jewels, and their feathers, and their spiritual and temporal power. They bound men's soul and body in slavery, forcing upon them subservience to the gods, and using them as tools for building temples. These crowned heads excelled in destruction, in fields drenched with blood, and in cities wasted by fire, they lived lives of abomination, and their names are execrable. Yet all they did was called, divine, and while to the glory of the gods they filled the earth with darkness, they accumulated the greater glory to themselves. Not over the brow of any one of them did, holiness, shine. And since Israel's high priest has passed away, and his royal crown has been lost, lost in the darkness of pagan triumph, there have arisen upon this earth fresh priest kings or at least rulers who have swayed both the spiritual and temporal kingdoms of this world. In the name of the living God, and as representatives of the Prince of Peace, these rulers have but too faithfully followed the footsteps of the pagans. The wails of orphans and widows, the roar of blazing villages, the crackling of bonfires, the moans of torture chambers, these are Christendom's praise songs to the glory. The private lives of these priest kings have been pages of infamy, while their noble tombs adorn the Christian temples where the dust awaits the call to God's judgment throne. Our own generation has seen temporal and spiritual dominion burn villages and drive thousands to starvation, it has read and knows the history of the deeds of the Dark Acres. Yet there are thousands of men today banded together once more to crown one head to the greater glory of God with soul spiritual and temporal power. Wherein Christendom has one of these crowns ever borne, holiness to the Lord, upon it. It is certain that our Eliezer, who flourished in Hadrian's reign, saw it in Rome. It was, doubtless, placed, with other spoils of the temple, in the temple of peace. Although Christendom has rivaled paganism in abominations and blood, it has not yet reached to its climax of iniquity. It shall have a ruler, who in himself will unite both spiritual and temporal dominion, and shall bear upon the forehead a name, exceeding in its horror every other name of evil, Babylon. And this shall be inscribed with the blood of martyrs upon its crown, its proud iron band of apostasy from God. I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. Drunken with the blood of the saints, and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. Revelation chapter 17 verses 3, 5, 6. But, he must reign, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 25, he will come forth according to the promise of God, and the music of the golden bells shall be heard over the face of the earth. The robes of the high priest worn on the great day of atonement were entirely different from those just enumerated. They were four in number, and were composed wholly of linen, yet not of the resplendent linen of the golden garments, but merely of white linen. Their utterance was purity, only, purity, all purity. On the great day of atonement the high priest, clad in white, entered the holiest, and stood before the throne of Jehovah. No golden bells made music at his coming, no names of men were upborne upon his shoulders, or pressed upon his breast. He entered the presence of the Holy One shrouded in a cloud of incense with the blood shed for sin. He was alone, the sacred precincts were empty, the voices of the people were hushed. He carried the blood into the dread presence of Jehovah, and sprinkled it upon and before the throne. He placed it upon the golden mercy seat, towards which the faces of the cherubim inclined, and in immediate proximity to the place where Jehovah dwelt, and whence he uttered his commands concerning the people of Israel. On that occasion the sin of man, the blood shed for that sin, and the throne of Jehovah were brought together, and the connecting power was the person of the high priest. And in this great act he expresses in his person one of the grandest types of Christ existing in the scriptures. Both the nature of Jehovah's high priest and his service are shown in strong contrast with the high priests of Egypt. The prince was the great high priest. 
the whole religion of the gnome rested upon him, and originally he performed its ceremonies. Of these the chief was sacrifice, that is to say, a banquet which it was his duty to prepare and lay before the god with his own hands. The god was present both in body and double, suffering himself to be clothed and perfumed, eating and drinking of the best that was set on the table before him. The chief priest of Ra, at Heliopolis, and in all the cities which adopted the Heliopolitan form of worship, was called Oirimai, the master of visions. And he alone, beside the sovereign of the gnome, or of Egypt, enjoyed the privilege of penetrating into the sanctuary, of entering into heaven, and there beholding the god face to face. Having accomplished the service, the high priest laid aside his white robes, and they were hid away, neither were white robes worn again until a new year called for a fresh atonement. Soiled garments of the high priest were hid away. The high priest wore a fresh suit of linen vestments each time on the day of atonement. The contrast between the two sets of garments is as marked as possible. The state garments were handed down from father to son, and were preserved with vigilant care, the others were disposed of when once used. The one set displayed the glories of priestly intercession and the fulfilling of God's promises, both to men and the earth, the other described the one necessity for effecting atonement for sin, sinlessness. The glorious robes were mentioned first. And in the order of the divine unfolding in the books of Moses, the prime thought or purpose of God usually comes first, and the manner of its fulfillment next. The high priest's appearance, at all times, in the holiest in his mediatorial robes was the first great purpose of God. But because of the sin of the priests which will be dealt with in our next chapter, Aaron was not allowed to come thus at all times before Jehovah, c.p. Leviticus chapter 9 verse 23, 16-2, and, indeed, he never appeared in the holiest thus arrayed, unless it were on the first occasion of his entering into the dwelling place of God together with Moses. The intercession of Christ in heaven for us, is based upon his having entered in once into the holiest by virtue of his blood, and he, having obtained eternal redemption. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 12, is crowned with glory and honor, chapter 2 verse 9. The white robes, speaking figuratively, worn when, he was, made sin for us who knew no sin, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21, are hid away, forever. His atoning work is complete, his mediatorial work is continuous, his blood once shed has exalted the throne of God forever. His life of service on high without a break exalts the love of God for his own to all eternity. The glory and honor with which he is now crowned answer to the robes of glory and beauty of the high priest in Israel, who was a figure of the true high priest of God. The high priest of Jehovah was the fountainhead of the priesthood, all flowed out from him. His position in relation to Jehovah and Israel called for a family of priests to serve with him. In this he was a notable type of Christ, from whom all true Christian priesthood emanates. He is the high priest in heaven, and, indeed, if he were on earth he should not be a priest, Hebrews chapter 8 verse 4, and from his heavenly glory he has made his people on earth the family of priests to his God and Father. The garments of the ordinary priests partook of the character of those of the high priest, their three chief garments were composed of white linen, two of glistering white, the other of plain white. They were girded like the high priest, accepting the gold in the girdle. The symbol of the divine was not in the girdles, but in the blue, the words are to be read, as is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly, 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 48, in the purple. Joint heirs with Christ, Romans chapter 8 verse 17, in the scarlet, if we suffer we shall also reign with him, 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 12, and in the glistering white, holy and without blame before God. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. Holiness and glory were the two main significations of these robes. And as the root meaning of the word Kohen, priest, implies, their service was that of one who stands up for another and mediates in his cause. The garments were a general necessity for the priesthood in the performance of its service, the individual necessity for each priest prior to his service was purification. The body of the man had to be washed with pure water. Exodus chapter 29 verse 4, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 22. The figure declared that before a man could serve as a priest, he must be morally pure. He was sanctified by the washing of the water prior to taking office, hence, as holy, he assumed office, the office did not make him holy. The water was a sign, as has already been pointed out, it, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 13, and being merely water it did not impart a spiritual sanctification. After the purification, followed adorning, and then the anointing. The stamp of the number three was impressed upon the persons who served the tabernacle, as well as upon the tabernacle they served. The anointing oil was poured upon the head. According to the Jewish tradition the anointing of Aaron the high priest was different from that of the sons of Aaron, the ordinary priests, the oil being poured upon the head of the former. Whilst it was merely smeared with the finger upon the forehead in the case of the latter. 
the oil asterisk is a figure of the Holy Spirit, and, like the precious ointment upon the head, that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments, God, through his Holy Spirit, commands the blessing, even life forevermore, Psalm chapter 133 verses 2 to 3, through his high priest. Every typical feature of robes and actions finds in the outpouring of the Spirit of God its fulfillment. From the time of the second temple, when the sacred oil, said to have been hid by Josiah and lost, was wanting. This putting on of the garments was deemed the official investiture of the office. Smith's Dictionary of the Bible, Art, High Priest. The absence of the sacred oil, type of the Holy Spirit, is most suggestive. The very shadows of the good things to come were fast losing their form. The second temple had but a stone for the ark. The priests might to the outward eye appear as excellent as did Aaron, but the emblems which spoke of divine power were no more. After the priests had been made personally fit for their service, a series of sacrifices was offered on their behalf, by which they were made officially fit to mediate on account of others. The peculiar character of Jehovah's priesthood, and its strong contrast with other existing priesthoods, are most striking. The priests were not to possess themselves of the land, as was the case in Egypt. The priesthoods of the old world were unhallowed associations which used their spiritual powers to aggrandize their authority, their treasures, and their temples, and more, to enslave the souls, and, at times, the bodies, of the people. The high priests were grandees, and wielded their powers as did bishops in our medieval times. The priests of Jehovah were not instituted to be a class who, as the pagan priests, should lord it over others, asterisk, but to be his servants, who should act for him amongst men. The age at which a priest, if he were fortunate, might attain to those various degrees of rank, the five degrees, the age at which a priest, if he were fortunate, might attain to those various degrees of rank. The five degrees, is shown by the biography of the high priest Beckenshon, who served and died under Ramesses II. From his fifth to his fifteenth year he received a military education in one of the royal stables. At the age of sixteen he entered the service of Amon, as U.A. He held this inferior rank till the age of twenty, after which he officiated as divine father for twelve years. When he was thirty-two he entered the order of prophets, for fifteen years he served as third, and for twelve years as second prophet. Finally, in his fifty-ninth year, the monarch raised him to be, first prophet of Amon, and chief of the prophets of all the gods. The power of the Egyptian priests over an individual would even reach him after death. And their veto could prevent his being buried in his tomb. They usurped the power and place of the gods, whose will they affected to be commissioned to pronounce. And they acted as though the community had been made for their rule, and not their own office for the benefit of the community. The corruptions that had arisen from the union of temporal and spiritual power in the priesthood, may be one reason why Jehovah separated the princes from the priests, and the ruler from the high priest in Israel. The kingdom of God is not advanced by worldly patronage, spiritual power is of God the Spirit, and is in no sense the result of a high position in the world. Jehovah was the inheritance of his priests among the children of Israel. The priests were not to be princes, as were the heathen. Their true power in Israel was spiritual. Their income, which, even under the most favorable circumstances, must have been moderate, was dependent on the varying religious state of the nation. Since no law existed by which either the payment of tithes or any other offerings could be enforced. How little power or influence, comparatively speaking, the priesthood wielded, is sufficiently known from Jewish history. In striking contrast with Israel's priesthood, the Egyptians possessed enormous power and wealth. The feudal lords did not disdain to combine the priesthood of the temples dependent on them with the general supervision of the different worships practiced on their lands. The whole of Egypt is said to have been divided into three equal parts the first of which belonged to the priests. The dawn of civilization, Maspero, pp. 304, 303, footnote. The history of the high priests affords an insight into the gradual loss by man of the divine purpose in the priesthood, and concludes with an emphatic departure from that purpose. As Israel left the faith and suffered for their sin, the priesthood lost one and another of its distinctive glories. The holiest of all possessed but a slab of stone instead of the Ark of Jehovah, when the high priests sought to be priest kings, and eventually to the heathen it fell to forbid them their royal diadem. At the time of Christ the personal glory of the high priesthood had vanished, for Herod made men of low birth high priests, deposed them at his will, and named others in their room. After Christ's ascension this personal nobility was miserably ridiculed, for the last of the high priests was chosen by lot from the ordinary priests and was robed in impious mockery of the divine command given to Moses. Thus the glory and honor with which Jehovah had invested the office perished from off the earth by means of the sins of Israel and the triumph of the pagan.
but before this hopeless darkness had closed over the high priesthood on earth, the heavens above received the great high priest, whom Aaron typified, in his unsullyable glory, to fill the highest exaltation there. Aaron himself, by his being stripped of his robes upon Mount Hor, and by the transference of them to his son, and then by his death upon that mount. Forewarned Israel of the weakness of man in representing the high priest of God, who lives to die no more. He went up into the mountain, in the sight of all the congregation, Numbers chapter 20 verses 27 to 28, a striking contrast to the high priest above, who ascended to heaven with hands uplifted in blessing. Luke chapter 24 verse 50, and Aaron, died there in the top of the mount, and his son, dressed in the sacred robes, returned with Moses to the camp to fulfill the high priestly functions in his father's stead, but Christ. Because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable, or, rather, untransmissible, priesthood. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 24. Aaron, with Moses, failed in patience, and because he did so, died upon the mount, but Christ's patience is exhaustless. And the temptations under which he suffered when on earth, have only rendered him the more suited to succor his people when they are tempted, Hebrews chapter 11 verse 18, and when they, like thirsting Israel, are guilty of murmuring. For, has been immemorially treated as a proper name, yet is probably only an archaic form of the common Hebrew term for mountain. The historic facts of the loss of the oil of consecration, the breastplate, and the crown, are but finger posts erected by divine command, to direct man as he passes along the highway of time. To lift his eye from all human types of Christ, however glorious, and though glorious as was Aaron, and from all earth's priests to the heavens above. For there, we see Jesus, crowned with glory and honor, Hebrews chapter 2 verse 9, a minister of the sanctuary, and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man, Hebrews chapter 8 verse 2, perfected forevermore. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 28. Revised version.